Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. We'll go. We'll start the webinar here in about two minutes or so. Uh, give uh, everyone else a little bit more time to join us. Okay, we'll start here in about another minute or so. Can everyone hear us okay? Okay, we can go ahead and get started here today. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lynn Ashton, and I am the chairman of the board and grants committee chair of the Honorable Order of Kentucky Colonels. Today, we are excited to host a webinar to review the 2020 grant cycle and application process. We are continually trying to improve our process, and we welcome any feedback you may have. Joining me today is the Executive Director of the Kentucky Colonels, Sherry Kroos, and Eric Patterson, our Grants Administrator. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. To give you an overview on what we will be covering today, we will start by providing a brief history and changes to the process for 2020. Then we will cover our granting guidelines. After that, Eric will give you a brief overview of the grant software system for any new applicants and we will wrap up by answering any questions you may have. As we go through the presentation today, I encourage you to go ahead and ask questions and we will come back and answer them at the end. You can ask questions by typing them in the Q&A tab on the right side of your screen. I would also like to point out that there is a tab titled Handouts to the right of your screen, which has a copy of our draft 2020 guidelines as well as some helpful tips to the grant system. Please note the guidelines available for you to download at this time are still a draft. The finalized guidelines will be available when you apply. We recently had a board meeting to discuss potential changes to the guidelines, and there are still several items being discussed and revised before the applications open in January. I recommend downloading and reviewing them as we go through the webinar and as you complete the application process. The handouts will go into greater detail than will be shown in the presentation today. I would like to start off with a brief history about HOKC and our grants program. The Kentucky Colonels date back to 1813 when the first Colonel was commissioned. The colonels officially began awarding grants in 1951, and we have granted out over $50 million since that time. Currently, we are granting over $2 million a year as we strive to reach our goal of granting over $5 million annually. In 2019, we awarded $2.1 million to 265 organizations across the Commonwealth. These grant dollars are generated from the generosity of 30,000 active colonels in every state and in 49 countries, 
all of whom contribute to our Good Works program on an annual basis to support nonprofits like yourselves. We have made significant, and again, let me say, we have made significant changes to the process this year. We have removed the requirement to mail any copies of your application to HOKC. The application will be available through the same online system as last year. And this gives you the ability to save your application, allows for better communication about your application, and allows for historic materials to be saved online. If the individuals who had an account and completed your application last year is no longer with your organization or is no longer the main contact, or if you are a new applicant, please reach out to Eric Patterson and he will help you get access to your organization's account. New this year, we have three different application levels. The small grant application is for any request less than $2,500. The medium grant application is for grants between $2,500 and under $10,000. And a large application form for any grants $10,000 or more. Each of these three applications will be available after clicking apply on your dashboard. Please be aware of the application you are filling out and verify that it fits with your request. Completing the wrong application may negatively impact your grant decision. Please reach out to Eric if you would like to verify you have selected the right application. We highly recommend submitting your application early as possible to allow us to carefully review your application and inform you of any necessary changes you may need to make. We have also changed the number of bid requests depending upon the application or amount of dollars you are applying for. If you are applying for a grant of less than $2,500, then you will only need to get one bid per item and you do not have to upload copies of the bids into the system. But please remember that the trustee vetting your grant will be asking to see your bid. If you are requesting between $2,500 and under $10,000, then you are required to get two bids per item. And you are also required to upload copies of these bids into the system. If your request is $10,000 or more, you are still required to get three bids and all bids must be uploaded. Next, we will discuss the changes to which financial information will be requested. We are only requesting your organization's most recent two years completed 990s and your two most recent completed audit financial statements. If you do not have audited financial statements, you may submit the financials you have available, your balance sheet, your profit loss statements. This year, we are unveiling a policy that will restrict organizations for, for applying for a grant for a one-year period. If a grantee has received a grant multiple years in a row, the policy will be for an organization to set out one grant cycle after receiving three consecutive grants. This is important. You will be notified before January 10th if your organization will be required to wait a year before applying again in 2021. Let me repeat that. You will be notified before January 10th if your organization will be required to wait a year before applying again in 2021. Starting on January 2nd, you will be able to access the online grant system to log in or create your account if you are a new applicant. Once you are logged in, you will see the available applications. The first step of the application process is the letter of intent or LOI form. It will start by asking you a few eligibility questions and then ask you to upload your LOI on your letterhead along with a copy of your tax exempt certificate from the IRS. After submission, we will review your LOI and you will receive an email giving you access to complete the application form. Next, I would like to go over the 2020 grant cycle timeline with you. 
again, there are important changes this year because we have shortened parts of the cycle. As mentioned before, on January 2nd, you are eligible to log in or create your account to complete the LOI form. After your LOI is approved, you will see the application in the same area as the LOI for you to complete. Your applications must be submitted online no later than Friday, February 14th at 11.55 p.m. After being reviewed by Eric and myself, the grants will be reviewed by our grants committee and then move forward to our trustees for vetting. They will be contacting you to set up a site visit and to ask you some questions about your application. After all grants are reviewed, the approval vote will take place in early June. You will be notified by mid-June whether or not your grant was approved or denied. If your grant is approved, you have from the date that you received your approval letter until November 13th, not December as in the past, until November 13th, 2020, to turn in all receipts and su submit all documentation. We have shortened the review process to allow you to have additional time to purchase your items and complete your projects. The new timeline also shortens the amount of time between when you complete your application in February and when you hear about the grant decision in June. It is very important to submit before the deadline so you will have time to make corrections. If you submit at the deadline, internal review will be very limited. And this means that if your application is not entirely correct, your grant request could be negatively impacted. At this time, let's move on to review the 2020 grant guidelines. Eligibility. You will be asked to answer several questions when you submit your LOI form. Please take a moment to review the questions listed here. And if you have any questions, please type them now. Please take a moment to review these types of organizations if you, to see if you are an eligible organization or if you are an organization that we do not fund. If you have any questions on whether your organization qualifies for a grant, please type them now or reach out to Eric after today's webinar. What we fund. Funding is limited to items, projects that can be seen, felt, or touched. Requests for funding from the Kentucky Colonels should be for projects that will directly benefit as many of the clients you serve as possible. What we do not fund. Here is a list of several items that we will not fund. Please take a moment to review them and look at the limitations carefully. I want to remind you that all of these limitations are explained in greater detail in the guidelines that you can download. Reporting and reimbursements. Should funds be awarded, you will have until Friday, November 13th, 2020, to provide the documentation specific to the expenditure to claim your grant monies. You will not receive a check until documentation has been uploaded. All items must be purchased between the date of the grant award, which will be mid-June, and Friday, November 13th, 2020. If the deadline for grant completion cannot be met, the recipient must request and must receive an extension. This needs to be done via email. If the funding commitment is to remain in effect, such requests must be received no later than Friday, October 30th, 2020. Please be aware that very few extensions are granted and they require extreme circumstances. For example, in the past, we have granted an extension to an organization who was waiting on a federal grant. We do understand that issues may arise, but it does take a significant reason for your grant extension to be approved advisory information. Matching grants. The Kentucky Colonels will 
often uh, make partial grants on a matching grant basis, meaning that the application must the applicant must raise the rest of the money requested from other sources, including its own. If approved for a matching grant this year, you will uh, need to provide the matching partner when you are requesting your reimbursement. If you are a large multi-hospital system, know that only one hospital is eligible to apply per year. Large multi-hospital systems are defined as any hospital corporation operating five or more facilities in the Commonwealth. Also, please note that large hospital systems are carefully vetted and are generally not funded. Please reach out to us before applying to determine if your organization will be eligible. If your organization is a part of a large hospital system and a grant is awarded, you may not be eligible to receive a grant in the next grant cycle. Recognizing the colonels. Grant recipients are expected to acknowledge the Kentucky colonels. Items such as plaques, decals, vanity license plates will be provided to the recipient by the Kentucky colonels. Items not provided by the Kentucky colonels will need our approval. Reciprocal PR is appreciated in the form of social media and our newsletters. If approved for a grant, we may reach out to you for information such as pictures, quotes, and other relevant information for the grant received. We have provided a follow-up form through the grant system for you to upload information mentioned above. At this time, let me turn it over to Sherry, who will go over the finance changes. Good morning again. Let me address a couple of the sound issues for you. I'm so sorry some of you have had some issues. We are recording this webinar and it will be up online. So if you missed it, Eric will send slides, but you can also listen to the recording again. And as mentioned by William, the handouts are very much in detail of what we've gone on. So that might cover your questions. Now let me point out again, some of the financial questions you will see on the application two available uploads for your two most recently completed 990s. That's different than last year. And there's an upload for your most recently completed audited financial statements. If you are not required to file a 990, you must attach your reason for exemption via this upload. Also, if you do not have audited financials to upload, you may upload the financials that you have, including a balance sheet or profit loss statement. Eric will go over the registration process for anyone who has not registered in the past. If you've applied last year, then you do not need to stay online, but wait, don't go anywhere yet for the rest of the webinar, unless you have some questions at the end. Couple, don't, don't go anywhere yet because this is really important. Eric has been called to jury duty. His first day is January 2nd. So that application will go on on January 2nd, but please give him 24 to 48 hours to answer LOIs or any questions you have. And remember, this is a draft guidelines. We've made quite a few changes for 2020. So you will need to go and pull those guidelines down on January 2nd. So Thank you for attending. If you're going to jump off at this point, I highly recommend you stay on if you're a brand new applicant so he can go through the applications uh, process and how to upload it. So Eric is now going to go to open the application and to show you steps for registration. We are noting the questions you're have come through, such as religious organizations and private foundations. We will address those at the end of the, the uh, webinar. Eric, are you ready to go? Yeah, so I'll, the first thing I'll show you is the, the registration process again for anyone who needs, and I'll try to make it as easy as possible and to understand. Um, so there will be a link on our website, and um, if you also need the link, you can reach out to me as well to get to this page, um, to the login page. So to start, you can click Create Your Account, and it'll take you to this screen where you can um, enter in some brief information about your organization, including the name of your organization, tax information, as well as some contact and address information. Um, once this is completed, uh, you can click the next in the bottom right hand of the screen. And then that'll take you uh, to some questions about um, the person who will be applying for the grant. Um, it'll ask you for your email address and, again, contact information. 
Um, and there's also a copy address from organization button available for you in the top left. Um, and that can, that'll help you save some time instead of typing the address again. Once you have entered all this in, you can go ahead and click next. And the next stage will ask you if you're your organization's executive director. If you are not, it'll ask you to fill in the same applicant information. But if you click yes, then it'll just move you right on to the password creation. So once you answer and click next, um, if you click no, then it will ask you to fill out this information for your executive director, similar to what you filled out for yourself. And then once completed, you can click next again to create your password. Uh, it's important that you remember what your password is because you'll need it to log into the system throughout the entire process and to get back into your application. Once you create that and create your account, you will be taken to a screen that will verify that you're able to receive emails. This is also extremely important because if I have any questions about your application or to send you any updates about the application, um, I will be sending it through the email attached to the applicant. Um, so if you have any issues, please reach out to us or see if it got caught in your junk folder. But once you enter that, you can go ahead and click continue and that'll create your account. Um, I'm now going to navigate into the system to show you the letter of intent and um, application. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you here. Okay, so once you apply, uh, it'll bring you to the screen, your dashboard. Um, starting on January 2nd, you can go ahead and click this apply button here at the top. And it will show you the three available applications. Um, you'll notice that there is some details about the timeline and which application amount you're applying for. Uh, when you go to apply for whichever one of the three applications, you'll want to make sure you click the blue apply in the top right hand of the screen uh, for each application. So each application does have a separate apply button. Um, if you do have any questions and want to make sure you apply for the correct application, just reach out to me or um, I've tried to put it several places to know which amount you're applying for. I'm going to now navigate back to your dashboard and show you what the letter of intent looks like after you click the apply button. You'll see there's some brief information again about the application you're applying for, and then you'll see the eligibility questions as highlighted earlier by Lynn. Um, after you answer these, you can continue to scroll down, and it'll ask you for a little bit of information about your organization, including the county you're located in. And then the final part of the letter of intent is where you'll enter in project details and where you can upload your letter of intent and tax exempt certificate. Um, please note that these aren't finalized. You will be able to update these once you get onto the application if you aren't sure when you're filling out your letter of intent. So um, you can't see it here because it's already submitted, but if this was still needing to be submitted, there would be a blue submit letter of intent button here at the bottom right of the screen. I'm going to navigate back to the home screen. Once I approve the letter of intent, you'll receive an email giving you access back into the system to start your application. You'll notice that this line right here will appear on your screen application and a place for you, for you to edit here in the bottom right. Even if you haven't started it, this is where you'll go to begin your application. So once you click that, um, you will see that um, some of the questions have carried over from your letter of intent. Uh, you are able to update these if anything has changed or if you want to finalize the amount requested numbers based off your bids, you can do that here as well. I'm going to quickly scroll down here to a few of the notable sections on the application. So the bid section here, uh, when you click here, it'll download a standard Excel worksheet for you to fill in the items you're requesting and the bids that you would like. And this is what the form will look like. It's similar to as in years past. Um, it does have a little bit more information based on the new bid requirements. Uh, but once you complete this, set, you can save it and then upload it via one of these two file uploads here. And then these five spots below are, are places you can upload your bids and you can combine multiple bids into one file if you have more than these file uploads. 
And if you have any issues or need any help uploading files into the system, just let me know. Okay. All right, and then I'll now scroll down to the bottom of the screen. So when you complete your application, after answering all these questions, um, you can either save it if you're still working on it, or once you submit it, that'll let me know that you are done and ready for it to be reviewed. Uh, and then, let's see here. And again, I do want to uh, remind you that it will open on January 2nd, and that's when you can begin submitting your letter of intents. And I do want to let you know again that I have been selected for jury duty beginning on January 2nd. So please understand it could take me up to 24 hours to approve your letter of intent, but, but I will do it as quickly as I can. Um, so I'm now going to navigate back out of the system to our presentation. Thank you, Eric. Now at this time, let's take a few minutes and answer some of the questions that you all have placed. And Eric, please jump in if I've missed one. So one of the questions was, can a community foundation, a nonprofit community foundation apply for a grant? This is a great opportunity, as Linda mentioned earlier, for matching grant opportunities. So what would I like that to happen is if you're a community foundation, give us a call and tell us, ask us, talk to Eric and myself about the project you're thinking about and potentially we could go together. We do want to potentially increase our matching grants program with other foundations and a not profit, not for profit foundations as well as private foundations. So please give us a call and talk about it. There was also a question about a non a uh, private foundation that's nonprofit. Yes, we would look at that as well. Call Eric and Sherry and I or Eric and Sherry. Uh, religious organizations. We do have several religious organizations that have applied for grants in the past for particular programs. They run off of that off of their religious organization. Here's what the caveat is to that. It, the participants in your religious, in your program that's run by this religious organization uh, cannot be required to do any type of religious activity. They have, to, if you are running a homeless shelter, let's say, they can't be required to sit through a service to get the services of a homeless shelter. So if you need more explanation on that, again, give us a call. There was a question, and this is a new program we're starting this year, on if you've applied three years in a row, you have to sit off. As we said earlier in this webinar, we are going to make that determination and you will be notified by January 10th. So if you've applied three years in a row, don't automatically assume we're going to ask you to sit off a year. Eric and I will reach out to each one of the people that we will ask to sit off for a year, but that'll be between probably January 3rd and January 10th. So I hope that answered that question. There was a question about nonprofit schools, private schools. Are they eligible? Yes, they are eligible to apply. Um, there was a question about same ID and password for several organizations. No, we don't allow that at this point. It has to be one a EIN number associated with one organization. If and also, uh, also, I want to jump in. The system won't allow you to use the same email for multiple organizations. So if you are applying for multiple, you will need a separate email and account for each application you're applying for. That would be an example of YMCAs throughout different cities. If there's multiple YMCAs in, let's pick Louisville, only one of them can apply because a lot of them have the same EIN number. Uh, there was a question about one bid, and if there's only one vendor that supplies that particular product you're going to apply for. Yes, you can only go after one bid if there is only one vendor, specific vendor that gives you that product. You just have to explain to us on the bid sheet that there is only one company that provides that specialized product that you're looking for. Uh, Eric, have, I've missed some questions. You want to jump in? Yeah, I'm trying to. I've tried to remove some of the ones we've already answered here. Um, let's see. I see. Oh, I see one about changing emails sometime in January and February. Uh, well, John, boy, that's a hiccup for you guys, but it's not for us. Uh, yes, you can go into the application and change the email. If there's somehow a glitch with that, just call Eric and he will hand change it into the system. 
Let's see. And I'm reading the one about environmental organizations. So hang on a second. Oh, okay, that's the bid. That's a good. That's a good question about uh, equipment. There's certain vendors that do the equipment. Yes, if again, if it is a particular type of equipment and you're in a smaller community, you can only get two bids or one bids. We understand that. We just need we just need explanation on that. And when we read your bids, and this is why we stress get those applications in early. We did not cut the time down of when you're putting in your applications to us we have significantly reduced the time that Eric, Lynn, and myself will review them. And we want to give every applicant an opportunity to correct an error. So, and that error could be, we don't understand why you only got one bid. Eric wants to reach out to you and ask that question. So it's really important not to wait till February 13th, the day before the, the deadline. Uh, Eric, so... What have I missed? Let's see. I see several have came in through here. Um, let's see. Someone asked, could we discuss the criteria for evaluating grant applications? Uh, we can. And let me go back to uh, funding for a to expand a handicapped bathroom. Uh, absolutely. We have done that at several different uh, locations throughout the Commonwealth. So, yes, you can uh, you can request funds for that. Those are the type of projects we like the not construction, but the fact that you're being able to address uh, better, better address your people in your categories. Um, underfunding. Underfunding. Oh, no, underfunding. Can you explain a little bit more about software that you do and do not fund? So we wouldn't do Office 360. We wouldn't do Excel. We wouldn't do Word, those type of of software. But if you have software that is particular to training adult literacy, we would look at that type of software. Or we would look at software specific for children in daycares that help with reading ability. We would look at those type of softwares. Um, it's The software we don't fund is really the software that we, we all use every day in our work life. Uh, evaluate, can you discuss a little bit about evaluating grant applications? So it's, it's multi-level here. When Eric reviews them, he's looking for, in essence, T's crossed, I's dotted. And if there is any things we don't understand about, let's say, your 990s or your project where he will come back to you, that's the first round of evaluating. And then I will review each one of them. And we look at we look at 990s. We look at what does the top two people of your organization make um, and how does that potentially coincide with your 990s? We look at your location and where you are and how many people you reach. That's not a determining factor of not funding because we have many nonprofits that will only reach 100 people or so, but they're in really rural areas. So it's an all encompassing review of your project. We look if you have long range goals. We look if you have endowments, how big is your endowment, how effectively you utilize your funds and where do your funds come from? So after they go through me, they go to the grants chair and then they go to the grants committee. No grant is removed from, I'm going to call it the pot until you get into the grants committee. And then the grants committee reviews each one of them. It's, it's an all day meeting. There's 10 to 15 people on the grants committee and they literally go through each of the grants uh, on a higher level. And then those, after they get out of the grants committee, it goes and they're assigned to individual trustees and the individual trustees will reach out to the nonprofits and they will talk to them. They will come out and visit you. And in our organization, the trustees are the ones that make the determination what the grants get. It's not at truly a grants chair level or an Eric Patterson grants administration level. It's the trustees that make the determination because they understand what you do and how vital you are to the communities across the Commonwealth. I hope that answered that question. Eric, did I miss any? I think if you click on the the tab there. We have a few over in the Q&A section that have came through. 
Um, I'm not sure if we've covered all of them. We covered some of them. Okay, let me click over. A uh, project that spans two years. Uh, I'd, uh, what we'd like to talk to you about that one because traditionally our projects are one year, but I don't want to say no before I hear about the project. Um, what qualifies for a bid? I'm going to take a general project. So someone wants to redo a parking lot and the bid is for asphalt and gravel underneath. So there'd be a bid for gravel, then there'd be a bid for asphalt on top of it. I hope that answers. Um, okay, I'm looking at the advocacy activities question. Eric, do you want to jump? Is it empty dollars? We we don't. Um, so Grant, I, no, I'm sorry to pull you out. We don't fund any type of ag advocacy or legislation changes or lobbying or anything like that. But we do recommend, we do understand that many of our nonprofits do that and they have a person that does that or they produce materials. Um, so on that, you might want to call Eric, but I, I think our answer probably to that one is no. Uh, the nonprofit nurses foundation, this would be a great matching potential matching grant with the Kentucky colonels. So this would be one where you'd want to talk to us directly. To uh, well, I'd like to understand what you want us to fund because maybe we can help uh, put our pool our dollars together and help help more nurses. So we have a grant writer for two organizations. Uh, you'll just have your name under two different organizations. There'll be two different multiple. There'll be, there'll be two different EINs. You're not uncommon where there are, we do deal with grant writers from multiple organizations. And again, you'll just have to have two separate email accounts to link with the different organizations. Uh, I'm looking at the renovations to an existing building. Um, yes, we have certainly done exit doors and stairwells and fire escapes for existing buildings. The only qualifier would be is we'd want to make sure you own that building. We don't want to uh, to significantly improve a building that potentially you can move out of uh, later on and we've helped somebody else out. Eric, are there any other questions? That's all that I see. Um, unless anyone else has anything else, it looks like I think we've covered okay. everything. And I'm, I'm sure we haven't covered everything and I've said it several times and so is Lynn and Eric. You know, please feel free to give us a call. Um, we're open to any questions. We like to keep our grant applications. There, there are some very exact questions we need on them answered, but we want a very open dialogue with our nonprofits and we want to explore as much as we can uh, within guidelines for it. Now, at this time, I want to remind that these are again, draft guidelines. We're looking at board response that Eric and I have approached our board with, and we will tighten up those guidelines before January 2nd. Uh, and I'd like to remind any organization who's been awarded a 2019 grant cycle uh, award that tomorrow's your deadline, Friday the 13th. And we are still waiting for close to 40 of you to turn in your paperwork. So it's very important to get that done so we can get that money back in your hands and you can help those that, that you do such a great job with. So at this point, we're going to call it closed. Again, we have recorded this and you can pull this down and we will be able to send it to those that requested. So thank you very much. And I hope you all have a good morning and a great afternoon. Thank you, everybody.